Suspension is an amazing thing on mountain bikes, unless yours is badly set up. Now, suspension questions are by far the most common uh, in terms of what we get asked. So in today's video, we are gonna be looking at the most common suspension setup mistakes. And I'm gonna to explain to you what they mean in terms of handling on your bike, so you can identify if you've made them, and ultimately, how to get your bike feeling great. Good suspension setup, or at least a good base setup, has never been so easy, thanks to the fact that most of the major manufacturers offer charts that correlate to your body weight in order for you to get started. So you'll find uh, in the description underneath this video some links to some of the most major manufacturers out there and the pages with those charts on. Now quite often you will find on the back of a fork like this Fox one here and the same with this RockShox one, that there is actually a chart that correlates directly to body weight. So all you need to know is your body weight in pounds or kilograms according to the chart and inflate your suspension units according to that. And sometimes like the Fox number here, they actually give you a guideline on the damping settings as well. So those charts are actually really good. However, this is just a base setting and something you do need to explore further from. So like I said, there's gonna be loads of information underneath this video for you to look at afterwards, uh, according to your brand. Uh, but let's move on to actual suspension units themselves, just to clear up a few things. Now let's start with a fork, just so you can understand things. You've got a steerer tube and you've got a crown and you've got your upper legs, commonly known as the stanchion tubes. You've got your lower legs, also known as the sliders. Of course, you've got your axle on the bottom, you've got your disc mount, you've got all that stuff. Not too relevant for this video. And on the top, you have two items here. So you have your air valve, which on the Fox Fork is rider's left, same on the RockShox. On some brands, it might be on the right though. So just double check this on yours. And on the other leg, you have your damper. So one complete air leg, one complete damper leg. Now on virtually every suspension fork on the market, the compression damper will be on the top and the rebound damper will be on the bottom. Now the rebound damper tends to have a red dial just by default and it's normally a single dial. Now some more specialist forks can have two dials which I'll explain later on. And then on the top of the fork, you have your compression adjustment which tends to be blue across the board. Of course there are some differences here and there but normally blue for compression, red for rebound and it'll be the same on the shock. Some, like the Fox Grip Damper, just have a single blue dial and you can turn it all the way to lock the fork out or all the way uh, back again to keep it open. This one here has multiple settings. You have three positions on here and you also have a low speed compression adjuster. The same on the RockShox fork just here. Your fork might have two positions. It might just have a dial on there. So when you visit the manufacturer website of choice, they might ask you for an ID number or a product number of the fork. So if you don't know all the details of your fork, like the model, the travel, etc., look for the little ID number on the back. You get these on the shocks as well. On rock shocks, it's in this position, as you can see. On the Fox one, you can see it very clearly. It actually says ID on there. That's all you need, and that will give you all the information about your fork so you can get it set up. And when it comes to the shock absorbers, a little bit different. So you've got your main body, also known as the air can. You've got your main shaft, which actually is the damper body. So all your damping bits and pieces are on the inside of this, whereas this is full of air on the inside. And then you've got your adjustment. So you've got your air valve here, and then you've got on this particular model in the same place, you've got your compression, and underneath it, you've got the rebound. Note the compression is a lever. So you've got locked and open. So there's two position on here. Your particular one might have three or it might be a dial. So they do differ. And then underneath it, if you look from the underneath, you'll see the rebound is in red, uh, just for reference there. And visually, you might notice that this is a fairly standard looking shock, whereas the one on my nuke proof behind me has got a piggyback reservoir on there. So the piggyback reservoir is basically designed to make the shock handle a little bit better when things get a bit more rowdy and the shock heats up in use. So as the oil heats up on the inside, you can get inconsistencies in behavior. So the idea of the piggyback is to have more oil, more valves on the inside, so you've got a more consistent handling shock when it's really being pushed. Brilliant, of course, however, they come with a weight penalty. There's nothing wrong with these shocks in the right application. Now, the number one thing that most people can get wrong when setting up suspension is not having the correct spring rate on your bike. Now, spring rate essentially talks about how firm your suspension is. Now, as you probably know, 
Different manufacturers of suspension units and different frame manufacturers will recommend different amounts of sag for different styles of bike. Now it's really important to listen to what the manufacturer says because it will be directly relevant to the way that that bike handles. Now generally you can expect a sag to be between 20 and 30% of the available travel. And sag refers to the fact that suspension will sag under your body weight when you sit on the bike. This is necessary so suspension can track the ground as well as come up to absorb hits. Now let's talk about what happens if your bike is too firm or too soft. Now if it's too firm, essentially you're in for a rough ride. It's not going to feel very good. Now some people will set the suspension up firm thinking the bike feels more efficient uh, and arguably it could be more efficient in terms of pedaling but nowhere else because your suspension units are not going to be operating correctly. Because your suspension fork in this example I'm going to talk about will be too firm, the wheel is not going to track into the ground. So what happens is the fork sits up higher and it just won't be responsive to small bumps. Now small bumps, when you're riding at speed, the frequency of them translates as vibration. Now that vibration has to go somewhere and it's going to come through the handlebars and into your hands, which means you're going to be very uncomfortable. And in extreme cases, it can lead to hand pump. Uh, not a nice thing if that's something that you're prone to. The other thing that's going to happen, of course, is the tyre is not going to have the traction it needs to grip on the ground. The whole point of suspension is to suspend your body weight basically from the bike and let those wheels do their jobs and cut into the ground and give the bike traction and rolling speed. So make sure your bike isn't too firm. Now, if your bike's too soft, you've got a whole realm of other problems and your bike will be equally poor in terms of handling. Now, let's just talk about a few of these things. Now, the most obvious one is your bike is going to be sat too low in the travel. So two things are going to happen here. One of them, your cranks and your pedals are going to be incredibly low to the floor, which means when you're riding undulating terrain, you're far more likely to smack your feet on the ground. And that is just asking for a crash, to be honest. Uh, it's something that many of us have, have done over the years, clipped your feet as you've been riding. If your bike has too much sag, they're going to be that much closer to the floor. So get your sag set up right. The next one is your bike is just going to handle poorly. Doesn't matter how good the suspension system is on the bike that you're riding, if you're running too much sag, the bike is going to be moving around under your body weight as you're pedaling and you're moving around. That is wasting your energy. Your pedaling is going into moving the bike, not propelling you forwards. So just think about it, get your sag right and it's going to make everything feel better. And the last one, which is a bit more of an advanced one, is the further into the suspension units you get, the harder the rebound valving has got to work to control that unit. Because you're storing more energy in there, it wants to extend quicker, so the rebound has to work harder. This can lead to problems with rebound damping, which we're going to get to a bit later in the video. But ultimately, what you need to achieve is the correct sag for your body weight, for the style of riding that you do, and the bike. So check the manufacturer and see what it suggests and use that as your base setting. But thankfully, the best thing about most mountain bikes is that it will have suspension that has air as the spring medium, which means all you need to get the problem sorted is a shock pump. Make sure you own one of these if you have suspension on your bike. It's much easier than having to borrow one from your friend. They don't cost a lot and they rarely go wrong. So get yourself a good quality shock pump and that's all you need to get your bike handling great. Now, if your bike has a coil shock on there, you're gonna to need to do a little bit more work though, because you need to refer directly to body weight to get the optimum spring for yourself. So we're actually gonna put a spring calculator in the description underneath with all of the other stuff we referenced at the beginning of this video. Okay, next one is not setting the sag correctly. Now, yes, this is directly relevant to the spring rate that we've just been talking about, but how you actually set your sag can be quite dramatic in terms of how your bike feels. Now, the first issue that some people make, and it's a complete mistake, of course, is having compression damping on when you set your sag. Now, for example, on my rear shock here, this is in the open position. As you can see, it's moving quite freely. If I was to put this in a third position, it's almost locked. So what do you think is gonna happen if I try and set my sag up in this position? The shock's not gonna move properly and I'm gonna get a false reading. It's completely vital to make sure you've turned off all compression damping. So if your shock has a switch like this, switch it to the open position. If it has a dial, turn it fully counterclockwise. And the same applies to your fork. You don't want anything, any damping to be in the way of the spring rate when you're setting this up. Damping is just there to control the rate at which the axles sort of move up and down through the travel. The spring rate has to be set with nothing else affecting it. Not being at riding weight when you set up your sag. 
So this is actually something I think most people, even myself, have been guilty of at times because technically you want to be at your heaviest riding weight when you set your sag up so the bike is responsive to that weight. For example, if you have a hydration pack or you ride a body armor, it's all going to add weight, especially in that hydration pack if you carry water. Water weighs a lot, so make sure you're dressed up in your riding gear with your shoes, any protection helmets and things that you're going to wear because you're going to weigh quite a lot different and then set up your sag. Uh, otherwise, you're just doing yourself out of good suspension action. And the last one with setting up sag is setting your sag on the flat. Now, it's well documented that you would use a car park or workshop, kitchen floor, whatever it is, to get the sort of ballpark area for your sag set up. Now, whilst this is correct, it's not completely accurate to the way that you ride and the terrain and the style of riding that you're going to be doing. So, for example, if the manufacturer of your bike says to set up with 30% sag front and rear and you get yours matched with 30% sag on a flat ground, great. But don't think that that is where it's going to be forever. That is just a good place to start. You need them to get out riding and start monitoring what you're doing. Look at what you're doing with the O-rings on a bike. Are you using too much of your rear sag? Are you using too much of the front? You need to balance things out because dynamic sag is actually what really counts. Now your dynamic sag is the area that you sit on your bike the most when you're actually moving around on the trail. Now this can be a really hard thing to try and quantify and actually set up on a bike without having a telemetry system. So you do need to just kind of think about the style of riding you're doing. Now with that 30% sag front and rear, if you're a cross country rider, that's gonna be fairly accurate because of the fact you're gonna spend a lot of time sat, so middle of the bike, and then probably an equal amount of time climbing and descending. So that 30% is probably gonna give you good enough support for most riding. However, with downhill riding, aggressive trail riding or enduro riding, it's all gonna be different. For example, downhill riding, you're gonna probably need your front fork to be a little bit firmer just because of the sheer amount of weight that's gonna be transmitted to that front when you're powering into rough stuff. Likewise, probably the bigger mistake we see is people having undersprung rear ends on their bikes because they're set up with a balanced front and rear and then as soon as you're off-road riding aggressive trails, and let's face it, we all do like the best riding and the most fun riding when you're descending, your weight bias is always on the rear of the bike. You know, no matter what your fork is doing, you're gonna have more weight hanging off the back of the bike, your bum, your legs, everything is biased to the back. So actually, you might need to run your rear sag a little bit firmer just to compensate for that sort of overriding body position when you're actually out riding. So just think your dynamic sag is always gonna be a little bit different to your car park sag. So just bear that in mind with the style of riding that you do. The next issue we're gonna talk about is not equalizing your positive and negative air chambers. Now, on that air unit, on any fork or shock, you'll have a positive and a negative air chamber. The positive one is the one that you inflate, essentially, the one that you charge. Now, it's the one that handles your body weight and it's the one that suspends you. But you also have a negative chamber. And this negative chamber, I guess you could think of it as a, a counter spring. It's a spring against that positive chamber to help the, the initial action. So if you were to only have a positive air spring, uh, kind of like original air suspension, actually, you had to overcome the force to get it moving. So your fork or your shock would feel very firm, not really doing anything in the way of small bumps. And then once it opens, it goes banging through. By having a negative chamber on there, pushing against that positive, the initial action becomes very supple. So your fork responds or your shock responds to small bumps and it also enables it to ramp up. So it's a really important thing. And when you inflate the air into that positive chamber, there's a port between the two and that needs to equalize in order basically to inflate the negative chamber from the positive. Now, when it comes to equalizing the pressure, it's slightly different across brands, so you will want to just double check this. Uh, RockShox, for example, with their forks, say to get your base setting in, so use the chart on the forks to give you uh, the body weight and air pressure you need to put in. Put that into the fork, then disconnect your shock pump. Cycle the fork, 50% of the travel five times, and that should equalize it and then you might need to add more air pressure to get it back to where you need to be. Fox, for example, with the rear shock, slightly different. So they say to put your body weight uh, in terms of air pressure in. So if you're 200 pounds, you put 200 PSI in, and they say, put a 200 PSI in with your shock pump, leave the shock pump connected, then cycle the shock 25% of the travel 10 times. And then you might need to add a bit more air pressure in and disconnect and you're good to go. Like I said, it is slightly different between brands, some brands tell you to keep the shock pump on and some explicitly say, remove it. Just double check that. 
Okay, next up is being confused by the damping settings available to you. Now, some forks and shocks will have very simplified approaches with just a single dial or switch available to you. Others can have up to four different things for damping available to you. So let's just run through these and what they actually mean in terms of the damping. So you've got compression, you have rebound, you have high speed, you have low speed, and then I'm gonna to refer to how you actually measure those clicks. So firstly, we're talking about compression damping. Now compression damping is completely essential and it's something I see far too many people not running any of at all. Now compression damping is needed because it controls the rate at which the fork or the shock compresses, right? How it absorbs an impact. If you don't have any compression damping on, you're pretty much just running a spring and you're gonna use too much of that travel. And yes, you might get a fork to feel nice and supple when you're running it around a car park, you can feel it moving over the pavement cracks. It's not gonna be good off-road. You need the fork or the shock to act properly and absorb impact. That is what compression is for. And then there's rebound damping. So there's two major things to take into account this. Rebound, of course, means controlling the rate at which that suspension unit extends again after an impact. If you have too little rebound damping, it's gonna extend really fast. And actually this can make your handling really unpredictable. It will feel great when you're riding a fairly mellow trail with lots of tree roots and that because your suspension can just activate really quickly. However, you land, certainly land a big unpredictable jump like off a drop off or something you didn't see coming. And if that fork extends really quickly, the front end can go light and can actually throw you offline. So it's really important to actually have a good amount of rebound damp in there to control your fork or shock correctly. However, it's very easy to put too much on. And if you have too much rebound damping front or rear, the units aren't going to extend fast enough in between impacts for the bike to return to the correct dynamic sag position. What then happens is you have a phenomenon known as packing down, where successively over rougher terrain, the bike will get lower and lower in its travel as the units aren't acting correctly. So the bike will feel horrible, you lose control because your tires are scratching around and you're going to feel all the impacts. So it's really important to get these right. And then there's how you actually apply the clicks of damping. So all brands will refer to damping in clicks. When you rotate the rebound dial, you'll feel it's indented with clicks on there. And on a compression dial like the one on top of here, it will be in clicks as well. Uh, it's a little bit different if you have a three position one because it's, it's simplified. But when they talk about clicks of damping, it will always be referred to from fully closed. Now for argument's sake, let's say for my body weight on this Fox Fork, they say I have between four and six clicks of high speed compression to apply. In order to do that, I would have to fully close it. So turn the high speed compression all the way clockwise until it doesn't move anymore, and then undo it between four and six clicks. And then of course there's high speed and low speed damping. So they both do very different things and they're very commonly confused. So high speed isn't referring to the speed you are moving at, the speed that you're traveling at, it's referring to the speed the unit moves at. So a high speed impact could be something, for example, like landing a big jump. You land a big jump, the suspension goes bang and moves fast. You need high speed compression to adjust that. Low speed, the complete opposite. The suspension units are moving slowly and accordingly, that has to do with body weight shifts and pedaling and things like that. Next up is not running enough low speed compression. Now, I would say this is probably more relevant with the suspension fork than the shock, because everyone knows what happens when you pedal and if your bike bobs around, you're gonna add some low speed compression, whether it's a dial or a switch, you know what it does instantly. But with a fork, I think many riders are guilty of not running any because they want their fork to feel really buttery uh, and plush over those small bumps, which of course it would with no low speed compression. However, you're gonna affect the way your bike feels in other situations on the trail. For example, if you are running into a super bumpy turn, as you're coming into that bumpy turn, you're gonna be on the brakes. So your braking is gonna load the fork up and that's gonna compress it, plus the bumps are gonna compress it. Suddenly, you're gonna be using way more travel than you should be for the size of the bumps and the way that you're braking. Uh, and it's ultimately, you're gonna feel the bumps more and you're not gonna have enough grip on the front end. The other factor you're going to have is you're going to have too much body weight on the front end because it's diving too much. All of this can be controlled with low speed compression. And actually, I would say that you're almost better off running more low speed compression and slightly less sag. 
I'd say that low speed compression can help keep the bike up in a better position than sag alone. And next up is not getting your rebound damping correct. Now, it's generally more of a problem on a shock, but I'll talk about the fork briefly. So too little rebound is very easy to actually do because you want your fork to feel really responsive and nice because you want to feel as little through your hands as possible. And I think we're all guilty from time to time of running your fork a bit faster than you probably should. Don't run it too fast though, because as you land from a jump, what you might find is it returns almost too quickly. The front end goes light, lose control, yada yada. Much easier to get control of this with the rebound on a fork. But with the rear end, it's a little bit different. And if you run it too fast, you'll know about it too quickly. But I think the problem that most people tend to suffer from is running too much rebound without necessarily realizing it. Now, a classic reason for having too much rebound would be, for example, you're at the local bike park, you hit that jump one too many times and it just kicked you a bit funny. So you're a bit scared and you wound on a few clicks of rebound. Now, technically on paper, that's the correct thing to do because what you're trying to achieve is slow down that suspension unit as it returns. That's the thing that makes it feel like you're gonna kick over the bars, of course. But actually, in reality, nine times out of 10, when that happens, it's probably because your bike is undersprung. So at the beginning of the video, I told you that your spring rate was the most important thing, and this is why. When your bike is fully compressed through that travel, it's gonna return faster, regardless of what the rebound is doing to control it. It's stored energy. So when you're cranking into those lips to pop off and get the jumps, if you're using too much of that compression, that stored energy has got to go somewhere. So you have to try and calm it down with more rebound. The key to making your bike feel more consistent is having the correct dynamic sag in the first place. If the bike is going less through the travel on those big compressions into the takeoffs, you'll need less rebound to control it because your bike won't be as deep into the stroke. So get your spring rate right, and then it will enable you to get your rebound right. So there we go, that is a list of the most classic suspension mistakes that we see happening. So if your bike's got air suspension, get friendly with your shock pump because that really, with some basic understanding, can alleviate a lot of them. I'm sure some of you have some questions about suspension setup, and of course we can go into tuning and different styles of suspension adjustment in another video. Uh, let us know what you want to know and we'll make it. Uh, get involved in those comments and we'll see you soon. Take care.